I think it's fair to say that the insect farming industry has hit an inflection point. Some might even call it an overhaul, others even a straight up bust. In this video, I wanna explain what's really been happening. Why are so many insect farming companies collapsing? What's went wrong? Or how a new wave of companies is rebuilding a more sustainable insect business model that could finally make this industry work. Stay till the end of the video and I'll give you the whole picture. I've been researching this field since 2013 and working inside it for six years as the CEO of Flybox. So what you're getting here isn't hype. I'm trying to give you the view from the trenches, so to speak, and all the conversations I have with other execs. And before anyone says I'm being pessimistic in this video, I'm not. I'm trying to be realistic. I still believe insects can become one of the pillars of a truly circular food system. That's why I get up in the morning. But first, we have to talk about the mess before we can even get to these awesome solutions that are out there. Basically, what the fly is going on out there? Things have gone from bad to worse for the big insect factory business model. First it was Enterra, then you had Yinsect, Agronutris, Hexafly before, and most recently Enorm. The list of these casualties seems to grow, and behind the scenes, even some of the big survivors that are still out there are looking shaky, at least from some of the information that, that I'm privy to. And I'd estimate that you're gonna continue seeing a large percentage of these big factories concentrated in Europe getting wiped out over the next few years. Really as an industry, it's time for soul searching. What exactly happened? And I wanna start from the bedrock, not just the biology or the engineering, which we'll get to, but let's start with the human psychology. And that is the predictable gold rush mentality of innovation. If someone discovers a natural process that looks like it could save the planet. Investors get excited, founders get funded, and soon there's a mega gold rush. In the case of insect farming, the logic was pretty simple. Insect are nature's recyclers, and they're a rich source of protein. Why not farm them at an industrial scale and turn waste into feed? This is a circular, sustainable dream, and there's nothing not to like there. And in principle, yes, it's brilliant. It does all of that. But in practice, economically, it's been disappointing, to say the least. Before I get into that, it's worth saying that this same market psychology, this boom and bust cycle, is a feature of agricultural tech or ag tech in general. Venture capital in ag tech has only really been a strategy since the mid 2000s with alternative proteins becoming a major trend from 2012 onwards. So whether it's lab grown meat, vertical farming, plant based meats, land based aquaculture, the pattern actually that I'm going to go through is the same. What's this pattern? Well, step one is there's a kind of narrative driven gold rush phase or the boom. So some compelling story emerges. In vertical farming, it's solving food deserts. Lab meat is ending slaughter. Land-based aqua will put an end to fishing our natural ecosystems. And this usually coincides with external triggers like climate headlines, policy pu pushes, or some kind of flagship IPO or mega round that kind of spurs things on. Either way, capital fl floods in and, cap and valuations get way ahead of the unit economics. And the idea here is to let the narrative carry the day and let the money flow in for the execs and the people making fees on this investment money. Step two is the big bust. It's when the scaling economics, regulatory bottlenecks, or slow adoption sets in, the sector experiences sharp pullbacks, companies fail, down round spread, and the investors kind of rotate out of the strategy. And vertical farming's crash is really a textbook example that we're all aware of in the news. Step three after this bust is the few firms that actually did reach technical feasibility and reliable unit economics, they consolidate market share, often with kind of more strategic investors stepping in, and the corporates partner with the IP left on the table and localize the technology to their supply chain issues, cautiously progressing now that the hype men are out of the picture capital becomes more discerning and specialist. And so finally, step four, what happens is a second generation of companies enters. I think you can already start seeing this. They've learned from these previous failures. Funding comes back, but more rationally, often in adjacent or derivative niches. So an example of this would be alt protein shifting from plant burgers to precision fermentation and hybrid products would be a good one. Or the vertical farming switching its focus from crops to high value herbs. So this is that maturity phase after the corporates get involved often each theme, whether it's insect protein, seaweed, vertical farming, all that stuff, has its early hype peak, its painful correction, and then a slower build towards a sustainable business model in various niches or corporate settings that, that makes sense. So hopefully that's clear that that's just a trend in general. The lag is fairly long. Usually it's between five to 10 years from this top of the hype peak to the rational scale. And that's because biological systems and food value chains move much slower than say software. So for insects, hype was probably about its peak about three years ago. 
and will emerge, but capital efficiency will be key. You could call it the Gartner hype cycle with real capex. So the trough of disillusionment is deeper and longer because of the biology and infrastructure. But the survivors can often become really highly defensible platform businesses when they actually get that fit. So that's the, the big payout at the end. This hype psychology comes from our craving, by the way, of good news stories. It's compounded by the fears of the climate change problem. We all want the climate issue to be solved, to no longer loom over us. And any new technology that seems like it could help gets us hyped up on social media and is also then highly attractive as an investor strategy. But the truth is no one knows it will really work. It's innovation. These business models are scribbled down on an envelope in the beginning. After the early players hoovered up nearly two billion pounds in venture capital over the last eight years, the chicken has come home to roost now. Or you could say the larvae has come home to pupate if you're in the industry. But these business models that were never really proven sustainable have now been exposed. And the bust, I think, is well underway. And we just need to all be honest about that. So I'd say that the era of mega factory insect farm VC funding is over. And paradoxically, that's the best possible thing for the long-term health of the industry and what I'm very excited to talk to you about next. But let's closely examine now why that old school insect farming model hasn't worked before we move on to these rays of hope I mentioned. By the way, if you're getting value out of this video, consider subscribing to the channel and please leave your thoughtful comments down below. I want this discussion video to be the start of a really good discussion. So... Let's go through the biggest reason for failure of the big factory insect farming model. There's no product market fit for insect end products. That's the pro insect protein, insect oil, and especially. Companies like Protix, to use an example, have only just managed to reach small operational profit. They announced this. Even with a product, the price that's two or three times higher than the commodities that insect protein they produce is trying to replace. Consider that soy meal, so soy protein, is $500 a ton. Poultry meal is $700 a ton. Fish meal is $1,500 a ton. Insect protein is $3,000, $4,000 a ton in Europe. You cannot expect feed mills or pet food producers or animal nutrition companies or ingredients buyers to pay two or four times more without a really, really strong reason. And the early players tried to justify or claim that their research shows that insect protein was better for animal health, the environment, and so on. But most of those benefits, if you actually know something about nutrition, can be achieved through cheaper ingredient blends. So just a quick example, like you say that chitin's good, but you can get it from shrimp, shrimp waste. Animal proteins you can get from fish meal, poultry or feather meal for sustainability. So you can address some of the claims that insects are through other cheaper ingredients. And now I don't want to minimize the research. Some really important things happened with insects, the value that they can have to certain animals. But the industry pushed it far harder to attract investors than to win over actual buyers. So many European buyers only purchased insect protein to subsidize the industry in the short term. That's actually what was going on. Large aquaculture companies, for example, consume tens of thousands of tons of protein annually for their feed. Under pressure from investors and regulators to decarbonize, they were willing to pay a green premium temporarily just to test the claims and also to tick the ESG box. Think about it, it's such a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of protein they buy. It's okay to subsidize it and be seen to be doing good. But once their actual trials ended and the economics didn't work or stack up as the PhD researchers at the insect company said, the subsidy stopped and the collapse started. So to summarize, here's why Western factories have failed. They focused on premium protein, trying to create a fancy new insect farming industry instead of starting from waste management. They massively priced CapEx. They built Rolls-Royce factories when a Ford Focus would have done just fine. There was no true product market fit. There was a temporary green premium dressed up as a scalable demand. And they scaled too fast before proving the fundamentals at the pilot scale. So now we have an industry that's burned billions, produces a product the market won't pay for or value the way that they expected, and built overly expensive plants and moved far too quickly and too confidently. No surprise we're here. That said, the situation, by the way, in the global south is a little different. Many solutions there are actually low capex and very climate friendly. They rely on the natural favorite, favorable climate, the cheap labor, low energy use and all that. But those markets, conversely, don't also value the product very highly. Like local buyers won't pay above soy or low grade fish meal prices. And since waste disposal is cheap there, just like dig a hole and bury it kind of cheap, there's little incentive to actually pay for processing of waste. So that market for waste isn't really there because that's based on regulations. So that means that even exports from Asia to Europe can lose their cost advantage also after shipping and tariffs take into account. So yes, it's cheaper to make technically in the global south. 
but still too expensive to compete where the products achieve their highest value. So it isn't a straightforward story as, yeah, the Global South will necessarily be amazingly better, but it is better. So what's next for this, this insect farming industry? Well, VCs are burned, so capital will have to come from, from elsewhere and with it a different strategy. As always, the clue lies in this typical ag tech cycle. Consolidation, the wiping out of inefficient players, refocusing on waste management first, smaller companies rebuilding real product market fit and lowering capex. This time, corporates in waste, food and agriculture will drive it through joint ventures with the survivors. And you can already see it happening. So PreZero, which brought AgriProteins IP, is launching a much more modest scale facility. Tesco's are testing insect-based pilots. And waste companies in the UK and Asia are quietly moving in with acquisitions and pilots in various countries. This is the rise of what I've called and what many people are now calling the insect waste management industry, or IWM. IWM is a fundamentally different model. It's lower cost, modular, built directly on waste sites, it eliminates logistic costs, which can be up to 40% of the cost of insect protein, and focuses on practical partnership with those companies that have waste and value a closed loop system. Breeding and entomology in the IWM business model becomes a service catered by specialist companies that supply new operators with a steady stream of juvenile larvae. The technology becomes hyper accessible and scalable because when you outsource lots of things, smaller scale sites can actually make sense. So they start small, scale gradually, and integrate directly within existing waste operations. And the real end market, it's dried and live insects. Now just think about it. Why is the industry trying to shoehorn in dried and defatted proteins and oils, all of which have massive competition from consistent and stable supply of alternatives like soy and fish meal? All the antimicrobial, the welfare, the supplementary goodness comes from the fact that feed is in fact an insect. Fish and chickens and pigs are biologically tuned to seek out insects, to recognize what they look like, hunt them, and it regulates all sorts of negative behaviors when they eat them. For welfare and fed as supplements, they can improve performance measurably. But critically, nothing can compete with an insect except an insect. Fish meal, soy meal, none of it looks like an insect. So this finally is, if you think about it, an end product that we can focus on as an industry that doesn't have a competition. So given the economics don't seem to work for these other end products, this is a much better solution. So now just think about what we've talked about. The vision becomes clear. We help existing corporates in waste and food deploy low cost viable systems, outsource the complex parts and produce truly circular local products that have no competition. Now, doesn't that sound like a much more compelling industry? and indeed potentially even a new investor theme. And that's what this new IWM represents. Waste is the key variable. The insects are just the byproduct. With organics to landfill bans coming into force around the world, for instance, in 2030 across Europe, in 2026, there's the simpler recycling scheme that hits the UK. Waste managers are desperate for new solutions. Food ret retailers want circular options rather than using anaerobic digestion for waste to energy. IWM fills that gap, it's fast to deploy, doesn't need a grid connection, and handles the waste streams that other technologies ignore or aren't useful for. Anaerobic digestion plants are already being flooded and starting to charge double what they did a year ago. That's because of the black bin waste coming from the Simpler Recycling Scheme and FOGO in Australia and all these schemes. IWM offers a flexible local complement. Even better, if we reframe the sector as waste management, not insect farming or animal farming, that removes the regulatory snafu because that's really slowed us down. Insects are decomposers, they're not livestock. The science is clear on that point. The rules just haven't caught up yet. So we need a name that pushes it in that direction. The boom kind of peaked in 2023. As with every cycle, insect farming will reemerge under a new narrative within the next few years. And I think IWM is the narrative that can deliver the goods showing receipts as fast as possible. Now is actually a very exciting time for this industry. The hype has cleared and there's space for the serious grounded players to rebuild on solid economics. If we truly believe, as I do, that insects should be a key part of a circular food system, then here is the vision we can start to orient ourselves slowly towards. Now my aim hasn't been to sound like the god emperor of the insect industry. I'm still learning myself. But just to, to share my take as someone who's been deep in the space for six years, and I do talk to founders and execs at all of the companies since I sell technology in this space. In this industry, many of those people agree with me in private. So I wanna bring this up 
for something now to discuss. I haven't just come up with it with my head. So hopefully this video has been useful. Do stay subscribed. If you like the video, you'll get all my future breakdowns as the story unfolds. I'll sorry if I've been sort of Eurocentric here, but frankly, that's where 80% of the capital has actually been deployed and lots of the headlines have come out of and where therefore the cycle that I mentioned is hitting the hardest. But do leave a comment down below if you have stories and data about the situation in developing countries or you think I've missed something which I undoubtedly have in a short video like this about the industry as it stands today. I hope this video will also serve as a motivator for those in the industry today and those wishing to enter it really soon to focus on the waste management problem and the end market fit. Researchers and commercial people are like, that's where we need your attention, that's where we need you starting companies and doing research. So let's align ourselves to the bit that people actually want, that's a natural fit like a glove into the things that already exist in the market. Instead of this big insect industry factory over here, let's integrate into the food system with practical waste management solutions, the unique end product, and the right partners for this kind of technology. From there, we can take the time to build the industry into what it can be.